Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel where I talk about all things tech and finance. And in this video, I'm going to be going over Bayesian regression. The real neat thing about Bayesian regression is that you actually don't need a ton of data in order to find a great fit to your actual data. And the primary difference between Bayesian regression and ordinary least squares, the frequentist approach, is that with ordinary least squares, you're trying to find a model that fits onto the data. Whereas in the Bayesian approach, you're trying to find a distribution that fits to your given data. One of the best use cases of Bayesian regression is that if you don't have a lot of data, that's fine. And also, if you have a given distribution, you can actually incorporate your own beliefs on that particular distribution to see whether or not those beliefs are in fact intact. And it's actually very intuitive in order to apply many types of distributions to see whether or not that particular parameter or that feature actually follows that distribution. And if you are able to find that distribution related to that given parameter, then you don't really actually don't even need a machine learning model because with that given distribution, you can easily just find the mean and your given standard deviation. And then you can easily find your probability of success when predicting a you know, given value with all these other given inputs. So it's very, very interesting to use. It's on the flip side of what we actually normally see in the machine learning realm. There are actually a few other ways as to why you should use Bayesian regression. First off, it's actually very flexible with new information. Second, it's very similar to that of human intuition, and it can also solve probability problems that can't normally be solved using the frequentist approach. And also, a very cool fun fact is that Nate Silver is a huge Bayesian guy. He is the guy who usually gets the outcomes of particular elections correct. So he uses many of Bayesian ideologies in order to get those predictions right. The objective of Bayesian regression is not to find a single best value, but to find the posterior distribution for your model parameters. Essentially, you are trying to find the distribution of your dependent variable and your independent variables as well. Our prediction value is more often than not the mean of our distribution. However, do note that the output's distribution is the most important part to figure out when using Bayesian regression. This is what the posterior probability of the model looks like. In fact, you should actually recognize this if you've seen Bayes' theorem because this is the exact format of Bayes' theorem. We can also break down this model. The posterior can be read as the probability of a model given new data is equal to the probability of new data given a model times the current model divided by the probability of your new data. When we don't have a lot of observations when training our model, the posterior distribution will be more spread out. If you have lots of observations, the posterior distribution will shrink and the maximum likelihood or a point will become more prominent. The model is essentially competing for a wide distribution or a sharp distribution. If you have an infinite amount of data, the parameters will converge to the values seen in ordinary least squares. Bayesian uses many different types of sampling techniques. However, the most popular approach is something called the Gibbs sampler. This is also known as the Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm where you would obtain a sequence of observations which are approximated from some probability distribution. This leads us to the topic of full conditionals. This is used heavily in the Markov chain Monte Carlo method, and we use the formulas of the full conditionals to simulate multivariate distributions of our parameters. Essentially, the full conditional is the conditional distribution on all the other variables. Okay, so let's begin with the Bayesian regression analysis. First and foremost, make sure you remove all of your environmental variables that you have over here because we are going to be using quite a lot of memory in today's demonstration. This is the data set that we'll be working with. Uh, note that this is pretty much a cleaned data set that I went ahead and I had originally 100, well, a few hundred thousand observations trying to identify whether or not a particular person was going to default on their loan and where one was a default and zero is not defaulting on that loan. So since I had so many observations, I thought it best that, you know, it'd be great to sort of just cluster everything together using a K-means uh, algorithm. And I went ahead and I scaled 
the observations for that particular loan default value. So each of these observations represents a cluster where that cluster represents an aggregate of observations that resides in that cluster. And these are the aggregate values that uh, are representative of that particular cluster ID. So we're gonna be using Bayesian in order to try and predict uh, whether or not our logit loan default rate is going to be relatively close to our true values that we have going on over here. And this is great, a great example for utilizing Bayesian because we don't have that many observations. So note that, as I said earlier, Bayesian is more of uh, is a Bayesian type of analysis. We don't need a ton of ton of data. And so this is one of the really cool things that we can potentially use to see whether or not Bayesian is actually great for this particular data set and whether or not this model is going to be great. All right, so let's go ahead and start cleaning our data set. So over here, I'm just storing the cluster IDs for the index. I'm going to be taking out that cluster where we have, you know, uh, we just have all of our observations and all of our features besides that very first one. Store our response variable and we want to normalize our resulting data that we have over here. And then the DF norm, this is essentially the same thing. We have eight of our features and everything is normalized. And then we just want to make sure we concatenate everything where we have our response and our DF norm and make sure to rename. Oop, let me rerun that, rerun everything. There we go. Make sure we rename everything for that DAT, which is going to be our final data set that we'll be using. And we have all of our independent variables that are normalized, and we have our logit alone default that we will be predicting. And over here, let's create our test and train sets. We have our X and Y variables that we'll be using for our overall training mechanism. And over here, I went ahead and I just created the uh, linear model to see you know how well it would do and our RMSE is you know 8.9% which is not that bad but it's really not that good either we can go ahead and construct the confidence intervals etc if you want to go for a frequentist approach but this is not a frequentist approach this could be Bayesian so over here we are going to be actually sort of simulating a Gibbs sampler also known as a Markov chain Monte Carlo method uh, which I've mentioned earlier of course but this is a really neat definition by the wiki. Uh, it's essentially trying to form, well, it's a neat sampling method to form a probability distribution for each of our futures. And so over here, I went ahead and I specified priors for the mu values, this could be our mean values, and each of these values will be denoted as zero. And then our G, alpha, and beta values, are, I just put it as 10 and 0 0.01, 0 0.01. So these specifications are actually gonna be used in order to identify the given distributions that we will be using over here. And this is just other variables that I'll be going through. I'm gonna be doing 100,000 of these observations and I'm gonna be creating stores where these stores store the observations that we will be simulating. And so these will be used in order to calculate the uh, this alpha stars, beta stars, et cetera. And then of course, store the test predictions, You know, uh, clean up some more data, then we have our beta currents, run all that, and then our fees. This will be used for our gamma distribution. And of course, I'll be going through that, through this entire loop. So I'll be let, I'll, let that run in the background and over here this is where the real sauce begins and note that everything that i'm doing here is largely from scratch and of course there's other packages that we can easily utilize and we don't have to go through the headache of going through and manually trying to solve our y star values or our x star values and i'll make sure to put the full conditionals on the screen which i've went ahead and derived so you can definitely take a look at that but all those all of these functions all these uh, variables are essentially based on the full conditional priors so we have over here we have the m star um, which is the mean standard deviation so on and so forth we have each of these observations that are associated with that and the real cool thing here is that we are going to be randomly distributing or getting a randomized value from this using the normal distribution uh, and store that as a beta current value. And then I do the exact same thing for each of my, each of my features that I am gonna be going through where we have eight of these beta features and we have eight observations that we are gonna be using the DAT, uh, where the DAT is over here and it'll just be the first eight because we're not going to be uh, randomly distributing or finding a distribution for the logit loan default over here. 
So we just do that for all of these values. And of course, we are going to be finding the random normal distribution for each of these beta, um, for each of these values that we have over here. And just name that beta uh, current eight for the eighth observation that we have over here. And then of course we have our phi, which is going to be our gamma distribution, which is going to uh, represent our uh, our next distribution, which we'll be using. So overall we'll be using a normal distribution and a gamma distribution in order to try to find a neat relationship amongst our data. And of course it's going to be running and you know, it's a very similar thing. We are always going to be sampling from our new observations, you know, A star, B star, etc. and store all those beta values into, um, oh, this is going to be from the normal distribution, but st store all of our values over here. And this is where our prediction is going to be coming into play. So we are going to be predicting our mean and our standard deviation. And then once we have our predictions, we can have our prediction store value where we have a normalized distribution on that. So we'll be storing each of these normal values, uh, each of these random distribution from the normal distribution values. And then of course we are going to be doing the exact same thing for the prediction store. store. And then we are, you know, be using a, somewhat of a exponential function over here, which is related to the statistics. And then over here, we are going to be, you know, doing pretty much the exact same thing, but we are going to be now predicting the values and see how well it has done. So the neat way of actually predicting via the Bayesian uh, statistics is that if your observations actually fall within that confidence interval, then you can safely say that uh, nine, with 95% certainty, since I'll be using a 95% confidence interval, that if it does fall into that range, then you are 95% sure that it is accurate over here. And then I'll just be incrementing the prediction accuracy by one and then dividing it by 20 since we are splitting our data set into an 80-20 set where 20 of these observations are our test outputs. So I'll let this run. It's just printing the output over here. It's going to go through 100,000 iterations and then we can go ahead and look at the burn charts. So I'll let that run and I'll see you soon. Okay. so. Everything ran, and this is our mean prediction accuracy. And if we want to take a look at what those values represent, uh, each of those iteration values among 100,000 observations of testing whether or not your accuracy is up to par based on this particular metric, um, this is the resulting value of 0.86%. Well, let's actually look at the outputs as to see what the actual distributions of our output looks like for our given parameters. And let's see if it actually plots. There we go. It took some time. And let me move myself over here. So this is the parameters that we see uh, related to each of these given parameters and see how well they fluctuate up and down. So the main purpose here is to see essentially how i guess like how um, fuzzy these actual distributions look like the more fuzzy it is the more likely that that distribution is a good fit for that particular parameter and it's also a likelihood that the data itself has converged so all of these lines these little tidbits over here these really sharp straight arrows or not arrows these sharp lines those represent the observations that represent the burn in so ideally we would always remove the first 1000 observations to remove the burn in uh, this is particularly related to the idea that the actual distribution itself actually resembles you know a distribution so if we actually take out the first 1000 or so values we would have a closer look to that particular overall distribution and also the first 1000 values also represent somewhat of a non-converging relationship. So ideally we would want to have a converging relationship. So that's why we would remove the first 1000 observations. However, there are literature out there that suggests otherwise that burn-in doesn't actually really matter. In fact, it's probably irrelevant or even detrimental to the overall scope of things. But this is the post burn-in as to you know what it looks like. It looks a lot more fuzzy, uh, which is definitely a good sign, uh, but we're just looking at it from a visual perspective. So the next test is actually to you, is related to the CODA library and it tests whether or not your data has converged or not. And this is the Jawiki test that we are going to be using and I'm just passing in 
uh, the you know the burned observations and telling it that the sampling method was a um, Monte Carlo simulation over here and essentially if our p-values are greater than 0 0.05 then it is actually safe for us to assume that we could treat the first 1000 observations as not or as burning if it's less than 0 0.05 then you can tr you can't treat the first 1000 observations as burning uh, and then this just leads us to determine that each of our observations or each of our parameters has converged to a given point so that's really cool uh, next part, you know, if you want to uh, figure out your marginal posterior distributions, you just take the mean of your given distribution, and that is what your particular value is going to be if you ever come to predict that. You can also do the same thing for standard deviations, figure out what those are, and then you can figure out the quantiles, and then you can plot what those quantiles look like over here for each of our distributions. So if you wanna check out the significance of each of these distributions over here, uh, I made it so that like if the actual values actually you know, are greater than zero, as we can see over here, you, know, you sum everything up and then you divide by the number of iterations that you currently have. And if it's greater than zero, you know, then you would increment that. But if it's less than zero, as we can see for beta eight, it actually does not make sense related to our data set, our beta 8 which is our credit history length and it doesn't make sense to have a negative value associated with that so we can probably throw out that beta 8 term similarly for the other terms you know if you know if our certain threshold does not meet a specific point maybe our seventh term average account age we can't have a negative average account age so you know there's that so you do have to take that into consideration when you are working with these particular values so the higher the significance meaning the more positive your values are and if it makes sense then go ahead and uh, stick with that particular term over here you can also predict based on the you know the burn-in predictions this is what our predictions look like it's a big fuzzy caterpillar looking like and so that's like really really nice to have um and that's like a good sign for us to have and then of course you can have your various statistics you know look that that looks quite normal pretty good you can have your mean and your standard deviation and then your quantiles related to that particular distribution and of course, uh, you don't necessarily even need to do any of this from scratch. You can just actually use a available package, the R stand arm package. And over here, I just concatenated my previous data into an X and Y, combine them one together, and then all you do, you just pass in your Y variable, which in this case is equivalent to my logit loan default. I didn't change the name on this one, uh, but it does the exact same thing. So the default here sampling method is the MCMC, which is you know the sampling that we I attempted over here for the Gibbs sampler all the way up here. I attempted to do that, but. You know, it does the exact same thing. The prior distribution here is actually a normal distribution. And um, probably the, we actually look at this actually over here, prior summary. Um, we can actually look at the normal distribution to see, you know, what that prior would actually look like. And let's go back up here, check out the summary of this. And it gives you some really nice output. Probably the most important part, we actually run this stand fit. Probably the most important part is our hat values. We want to make sure that this is less than 1.1. And what essentially R hat is telling us is that if all chains you know, are stationary, R hat will be one. And if general, you want these to be less than 1.1, that should be a 1.1 over here. And it essentially measures the average variance amongst your samples within each of your chain chains that you're having with your Monte Carlo simulation. And then of course you're given you know, your various distributions. Um, you can even have, let me actually expand this window. Uh, and let's run that again. I'll fit. Yeah, you can actually have you know, your means, your standard deviation, and then you have a given distribution related to each of your values over here. And also the next term right here, mean PPD, which is the mean of the posterior prediction distribution. This is probably really important too, because this is related to your actual predictions as to what distribution it might follow. So that's really cool. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it related to Bayesian regression so if you like what you saw make sure you leave a like hit that subscribe button make sure you turn on those notifications on if you have any comments please let me know down in the comments and i hope to see you in my next video thank you so much for watching